again. So last week, two week, two or three weeks ago, this happened. There was some guy in Pioneer Square who was wearing like a, a mesh um, uh, tank top thingy and uh, jean shorts and mismatched chucks. And I was like, this is atrocious. So Gary decides, you know, he's going to wear a tie, class it up a bit. And uh, I don't know, I didn't feel like he could really do much better than I could. <laughs> so then yesterday, I actually forgot about this. Josh, are you in here? Yeah. Yeah. So he was, in fact, the only one wearing a tie yesterday. So I figured I'd better follow through with what I said. And so, yeah. Gary, you ready? Gary Bernhardt is going to talk to you about Unix. doing this kind of programming, and it is programming. And the special thing is that 
It's half-assed, but it's the right half of the ass. <laughs> we don't need to fully solve this problem. We just need to see that the tests run for each commit and see the output, and that's good enough. So this will be a recurring theme in this talk. Uh, half-assed is okay when you only need half of an ass. <laughs> and of course, ass is the binary state. There's many levels of ass, but half and full are, are good approximations. Okay, so now I get to philosophize for a moment. Uh, I have a quote here from the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. The language used at each level of a stratified design has primitives, means of combination, and means of abstraction appropriate to that level of detail. And I'm going to steal these three words throughout this talk to talk about Unix as a programmable system. Primitives, means of combination, means of abstraction. And briefly what these mean are, uh, primitives are things, in a language like Ruby, they're things like integers, lists, Excuse me, arrays, that was a Python again. Uh, <laughs> integers, arrays, strings. Means of combination primarily is the method call. That's how you take two ideas and put them together. And the means of abstraction is uh, a module, a class, a method. A way to take primitives and other abstractions, combine them with the means of combination, and then put a name on them to create a new abstraction. And these are sort of the three things you need for a truly programmable system in which you can build new ideas. And I'm using these terms loosely. Ableson and Sussman would probably not like my use of them so much, but uh, I think it's a wonderful way to talk about stuff like this. So in Unix, we have all the primitives of a normal language, like we have numbers, we have strings, we have arrays, uh, in the Unix shell. I keep, I'm going to say Unix throughout, I mean the shell. Uh, but we also have files as primitives, which are, uh, they are, they are, you can't change the way a file works, right? So it's a primitive part of the system. And binaries, like ls, is a primitive part of the system. You can't change it. Uh, it's there for your use to be combined to make other things. Now, if this is how you use Unix, if you deal with files and you execute commands, then you are using it like DOS. <laughs> and uh, that's okay. You can get stuff done. You know, you can CD and CP some stuff, MV, maybe RM, gem install, bundle, rail server, rake. You can do all these things, but uh, you're not using any of the power of Unix. You're just using it like DOS. Okay, enough philosophizing. <clears throat> Example two of three. Uh, this is a quote from a paper called Power Law Distributions and Class Relationships. And it says, a power law implies that small values are extremely common, whereas large values are extremely rare. Uh, and it's a mathematical distribution, and it looks like this if you plot it on a linear, linear axis. So at the left, you have many things with uh, a small number of something, and on the right, you have a uh, few things with a large number of something. And the paper I mentioned earlier is about object-oriented systems in this distribution. So here is a log-log plot, uh, so a power law shows up linearly. And this is the number of methods in a class on x, and the number of classes having that many methods on y. So basically what you're seeing is at the top left, there are huge numbers of classes with almost no methods. And on the bottom right, there's a very small number of classes with many, many methods. And uh, this distribution shows up all over the systems that we build, whether we want it to or not. It's just how things work, including the web, but also object-oriented systems. Here's another one. Number of fields on a class, this was for Java. Uh, same thing, power law distribution. Most of the system has few, and then there's these outliers that have a huge number. And one more, number of constructors per class. Same distribution. Like, almost everything you can think of is distributed in this way. It's really weird. This paper was 1.7 million lines of code analyzed, so it's not just a tiny example. 7,000 classes, roughly, in Java. And one thing they didn't mention is the number of references to a class. This is also power law distributed, both in terms of the number of times a class's name is mentioned in the code directly, and in, in terms of the number of times a method is called on objects of a given class. So, we're getting to Unix in just a second. <laughs> Why do we care about how many times a class is referenced in the system? Because the more times you reference a class, the more change it presents, or the more risk it presents in the face of change. If that highly referenced class changes, then everyone who's coupled to it is screwed. Right? So, we would like to find out what our most referenced classes are, just so we understand the risk of the system. Okay, so step one, 
find a list of classes. That's obviously what we need to do first before we can find out how many references there are. So I'm going to define a function called grep Ruby that finds all the Ruby files and then just greps them with some arguments I give it. So I can grep, grep Ruby for anything without having to repeat myself. We're going to start off by writing a really nasty Unix regex. It has a terrible regex format. It's truly atrocious. Uh, we're going to grep dash h, which means print out only the matching content, no file names. And we're grepping for any line that begins with zero or more spaces, then the word class or the word module, and then a word boundary. So these are, are all the lines that are defining classes and modules. We will remove all the leading space in all of those. So now we have a bunch of lines of code that say module something or class something smack up against the left. And then we will use cut to take the second field, white space delimited. So in the line module foo, we will take foo. And if we do this, we get an output like this. And this is the list of classes and modules in destroy all software's Rails app. Uh, not exhaustive, of course, because it's scrolled off. So now we've got a list of classes, and we just need to count the number of references for each of them. So we will take that thing we had before and pipe it into a loop, reading the class name each time. For each class name, we will print out the result of grepping the Ruby code, counting the number of files. So grep Ruby L is uh, show me only the matching lines that match the regex word boundary, class name, word boundary, so that's every reference, and then pipe that to wc-l to count the number. And then at the end of that string, we put the name. And end that loop, sort that thing numerically, and you get this. Uh, it's a small app, so the numbers are small. But this is the actual, actual number of times each class and module in destroy all software is referenced. And if you plot this on a linear linear axis, you get this. Even though it's a tiny sample, it's actually as good a fit for power law as those ones from the paper were, which is kind of surprising to me. Uh, and I may have gotten lucky because application controller is such an outlier. And if you plot it on a log log axis, you get a roughly straight line. So this is actually another thing that's very useful because you want to know where the dangers in your system are. Uh, I consulted on a team last year that had a system of 20,000 lines, brand new system. 6,000 of those 20,000 lines referenced a single global object. Now, in that case, we kind of knew that that problem existed. Uh, I didn't do it, so. <laughs> uh, but you want to know, right? You want to know where these risky parts are. And I bet that you cannot name the top five most referenced classes in your system off the top of your head. So. It's a useful thing to do. <laughs> um, now, when I wrote this at the shell, it looked like this. Uh, I, I showed it to you in sort of a, a less interactive form because it just takes too long and I only have 30 minutes. Um, but when I, when I do this stuff directly, it, it looks much more ugly. So once again, half-ass is okay when you only need half of an ass. And uh, a power law distribution is especially amenable to half-assed work because the outliers are so far out there that if you are 50% wrong in your calculations, you're going to get pretty much the same outliers anyway. So half-assed answers just work so well so much of the time with so little work. It's kind of amazing. And now I will philosophize. Uh, first of all, the first thing about that to philosophize about is pipes, man. They're so, they're so good. Did you see all those pipes? All that data flowing through there? I wrote that thing in like a minute and a half. It's, it's amazing how, how fast you can compose uh, these data manipulations with pipes. And so here's some random stuff you can do with pipes. You can curl a script and execute it directly. This is the way, the recommended way to install RVM and uh, Homebrew. And and I, I'm not sure it's such a great idea, but uh, <laughs> it shows you how, how powerful the thing is. Likewise, you can curl Google directly into Vim. Um, if you colon W, it's probably not going to do anything, because you can't write to Google over the internet. But uh, it's, you can still at least get it in there. You can generate a diff from git and pipe it directly into Mercurial. And I did verify that this works, just to be sure. Mercurial knows git's diff format. Git doesn't know Mercurial's, because git's kind of you know, a bit of a hipster. But um, <laughs> this, this does work perfectly well. And of course, you can cap directly into cap. Uh, and you can do that actually as many times as you want. And, uh, if you do it enough times and wait, I'm just kidding, there's nothing that happens. 
so types are a special means of combination in Unix uh, that is not present in a normal language. And you also have means of combination like loops. And loops are special in Unix because they have standard in and standard out. You can shove data into them, and then they do whatever they want, printing stuff out, and then you can get that data flowing out the other end. Very different from normal loops. And subshells as well. In the first example, I put some stuff in parens with the set dash e. And that tells the shell to fork a new process and do that stuff in there. So if you set options, if you set variables, if you cd, it's all isolated within there. So very useful for combining things that need different, uh, different states. Now if you start, if you take the primitives uh, in Unix and then you start adding this stuff in, you have sort of a composable shell system. You can put pieces together, but you can't uh, build a new thing and put a name on it yet. And this is, I think, where a lot of people are with Unix, where they, they're, they're good at putting stuff together, but they're not building abstractions yet. <clears throat> so on to another example. This is a piece of the man page for LS. Uh, exactly, right? You had no idea, did you? <laughs> it is amazing how many options it has. I think I know what like four of these do. Um, so I, I, I came across this during uh, my preparations for this talk. And I saw this, and I looked at the lowercase letters, and I thought, what letters are not LS options? And I could have just read through it, but that would be boring. So what I did instead was, <laughs> you can pipe man to whatever you want. Uh, so if you pipe it to cat, you get uh, the man page, unsurprisingly. But there's a magic thing going on here where man pages actually contain backspaces, which is unfortunate, because they break program programmatic interoperability. So if you ever want to do this, if you ever want to manipulate a man page, pipe it to call-b, don't worry about what that does. Just type it in there and everything will be fine. Uh, so we can, we can grep that for, our, so it comes out the same. And we can grep that for uh, LS to try to find that usage line. And we get uh, a ton of stuff out. But we want that second line there, LS, open bracket, bunch of options. So let's grep for uh, zero or more spaces, LS, open bracket. And if we do that, we get just that line. Now, by doing this, we are robust against any unforeseen formatting changes to the man page. <laughs> very important, very important stuff. Uh, now, we can use awk to split on square brackets and take the second field. So that's everything between the first square bracket and the second, which is the options. And now, I'm going to wrap that in a function so I can use it later. And uh, I'm going to say the bad word again, so don't freak out. Uh, we're going to use Python to print, I know, print the set of all lowercase letters minus the set of that bash function, bash function, keyword there. And we get y, j, z, and v. So those are the non, the, the lowercase letters that are not ls options. Very important result. Uh, now, of course, I could have uh, it directly inlined that blob of bash code straight into the Python with the backticks and get the same result. Now, the first thing to note here, not half-assed enough. Far, far too much ass. Uh, <laughs> that thing is going to roll off the end of my ZSH history in about three months and never be seen again. There was no reason to do that other than it's fun. So, uh, now I'm going to philosophize again. Talking about ass is really not philosophizing. Here, what I did by adding a function is I used one of the shell's means of abstraction. And like I said earlier, the functions uh, in, in the shell have a standard in and a standard out. Data flows right through them. They're more special than, than a function in a language like Ruby. Because in Ruby, you get arguments and you return a fixed value. Uh, it is not lazy. In the shell, you take arguments. You also get a streaming input and you get a streaming output. That's standard in and standard out. And streaming standard error as well. But that's fairly un unusual to use uh, for crazy one-liners. So, uh, you have functions, you also have scripts, that's a means of combination, or a means of abstraction to put pieces together and put a new name on it. And if you start using this, you now have a fully programmable shell. You are using this shell in its sort of its full capacity as a programming language as well as an interactive interface to units. But also, uh, in that last example, I was, use, I was metaprogramming. I was using bash code to generate a thing that went into the Python code. And you can generate any language name, other language you want. 
Uh, most common ones, of course, being your shell language, which is probably Bash or ZSH, uh, and Python, Ruby, and Perl, not in that order. So you are free to combine programming languages. And uh, this is, I guess, sort of the level above the three levels of programmability. Once you've got these abstractions down, you start generating code, but then you just kind of go crazy. So I'm not sure that this is such a good idea in the general case. That is uh, the end of my third example and my third piece of philosophizing. So now I will uh, give you some unsolicited advice that you probably don't want. First of all, two things to avoid uh, in, your use, in your use of any powerful tool, tool, Unix, Vim, Emacs, whatever big scary tool. First of all, there's this tar pit of immediacy that should be avoided. People learn how to do something, they find a solution to their immediate problem, and then they do that for 40 years. And if, you're, if your immediate solution was 10 seconds slower than my more refined solution and you do it for 40 years, you are losing. <laughs> so it's important to reevaluate the way you're using your tools, and especially to just interact with people and work, like pair program maybe, with other people and just see how they use their tools. And you will uh, absorb the, the better methods so fast. The second thing to avoid is proficiency fatalism, where you look at a master user of a Unix shell or a Vim or a Emacs, and you say, that person is so good at that that I can never do that. There's something special about them that's not special about me, or uh, it will take me so long to get good at it, I will suck for so long that it'll be a huge net loss. And especially that last one is just a, a complete lie. Um, if you start using Vim at 9 a.m., by 5 p.m. you will be uh, reasonably competent at editing text. You will be about as fast as you are in Notepad or text edit or something like that. A month in, you will be faster than whatever editor you came from, unless that editor is something truly powerful like Emacs and you were really good at it. <laughs> not yet, not yet. Uh, the, the third part of that statement, I'm so sorry to you laugh. The third part of that statement is, a year in, you will be faster than whatever you came from, even if it's Emacs. <laughs> I'm allowed to say that because I used Emacs for years before Vim, so I know, I know the dark side. Um, okay, so, so those are two things not to do. Uh, the, the tar pit of immediacy and proficiency fatalism. Two things that you probably should do, two recommendations I will give you without you asking, are uh, number one, use more pipes and functions. Uh, do stupid stuff like the LS thing I did just to learn how to do it. I probably wouldn't do that if I were doing billable work because that's not really the most useful thing for my clients. But uh, on, on my own time, I'll do crazy stuff like that all the time just to learn new things and to ingrain it in my brain. And especially uh, the first example I gave you about running tests over git commands, I actually retype that fairly regularly from scratch because it keeps it in my fingers. I am not going to forget it. And it only takes like 30 seconds anyway. Second recommendation, pay attention to how much ass you need. Um, there, there is this whole spectrum and we have modern movements on both ends, actually. You have the craftsmanship movement, which is very concerned with quality, and that is a very high-ass vocation. And <laughs> I'm, I'm involved with the craftsmanship movement, so I'm not insulting you by, by using the word ass. Uh, you, on the other hand, you have Lean Startup, which is um, not about low quality, but it's all about sort of like titrating that ass one drop at a time, and just getting the minimum amount of quality you need to answer the question. I'm glad you guys remember what titrating is from, from <laughs> uh, So, programmers naturally operate at a high ass level. And so, so, not high enough. Right? Um, so, I would encourage you to strive to achieve the full range of ass. And I think that, uh, that that is sort of one of the, one of the things that can make someone uh, truly deserve to be called a master software developer, is they can operate from the tiniest drop of ass to the, to the biggest ass. <laughs> and uh, I say that, and I do not consider myself a master software developer. I just want to say that because I don't want to sound even more arrogant than I actually am. Um, now, I, I want to make it clear that I've used the word ass throughout this talk because if I used the word quality or business value or something, 
uh, that brings all kinds of baggage, but ass just makes you laugh, and it doesn't contain a bunch of um, preconceptions. So really what I'm talking about is quality, I guess, but that word has all kinds of weird stuff associated with it. So <clears throat> that is all I have to tell you about Unix. Uh, the thing that I do is a company called Destroy All Software. You saw a list of its class names earlier. <laughs> and Destroy All Software makes screencasts for serious developers. Um, Topics like Unix, all of this stuff, but also dynamic languages, mostly Ruby, Git and distributed version control, uh, fast tests, one millisecond per, te per test. You saw me do a lightning talk about that yesterday. Test room development, OO design, using Vim effectively, all this kind of stuff. If you're interested, destroyallsoftware.com. Um, and actually, as of this conference, this is now my full time job. So. <laughs> structured this perfectly so that now you have to clap for me again. <laughs> yeah, we have five minutes. Go ahead. What are your last names for coupon? So what's your coupon for? Oh, what's it? <laughs> if you would like a Destroy All Software coupon, uh, come find me. I have a bunch of them. They'll give you a free month. It's not, no, it's not that kind of coupon code. They're one-offs. They're randomly generated Unix commands. They're very cute. <laughs> <laughs> but they're like a little paper thing. Um, we have more time if there are questions or heckling or anything. Yeah? How are you getting more comfortable with all those, all the new commands you're using? Yeah. Um, number one way, like I said, is sit next to somebody. Oh, sorry. Um, the question is, how, how do I recommend getting more comfortable with, with all this Unix stuff that I show? And the number one way is absolutely <coughs> pair with someone. <laughs> Just find someone who knows it and sit next to them. That's how I learned uh, most of this stuff. But uh, actually, this, but aside from that answer, there's not a good answer to this right now. And this is one of the reasons that I created Destroy All Software, because I want people to know these things. And I also, it would be nice if I could make a living doing it. Um, but screencasting is the best venue I know of if you can't sit next to someone who knows it. So um, it doesn't have to be destroy all software. Peep code has, has stuff about these topics, uh, and there are plenty of screencasts to be found around the web. So you can try that avenue. Yeah? If you're in the Seattle area, you can come to Seattle RB every Tuesday night from 7 to 9, and we're happy to pair with you. Wonderful point. So if you're in Seattle, go to Seattle RB, sit next to Ryan Davis, and uh, you can learn all kinds of stuff like this from from osmosis, from him and all the other smart people there. Seattle RB is at uh, Vivace on Broadway, and it is, let's see if I can remember this, Tuesdays at 7? Yep. Yep, Tuesday at 7, um, every Tuesday at 7 um, at Vivace on Broadway. Can you give an example of how you do that script on a Windows box? <laughs>
learn to really understand the philosophy of Unix from the outside. You really have to be, be immersed in it or have it explain to you in, in a way like that. And uh, but once you get it, man, it's so good. It's so obviously right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think I'm out of time. So thank you guys again.